Hi, welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. And I want to talk today about my experience with using meditation and how I was able to help my son, who was 11 years old, heal during a very, very trying time in his in his life and in our lives. And what basically, let me tell you the story, what what actually happened, and then how how I handled it from my perspective, how he handled it, and how we came through on the other side. So basically, when my son was 11 years old, the week of Easter, when he was 11, he went on a ski trip with his best friend and their family, the Tollisons. And so right before leaving, he had got, he never ever got sick, but as a very rare circumstance, he happened to get a little stomach sickness, kind of a stomach flu. Because he was going to be gone for a week, I actually took him to the pediatrician. She gave him some probiotics and said, you know what, you don't really need any, you never take any antibiotics. Anyhow, you're pretty strong, immunologically speaking, so just take some probiotics and you should be fine in 24 to 48. So she cleared him to go on his, um, on his ski trip. And just a couple weeks before that, as luck or bad luck would have happened, while he was playing baseball, he had a baseball hit him right in the center of his spine. It knocked him out cold. So we, we had these set of circumstances preceding this going to this skiing trip. Um, when that incident happened, one of the parents was a doctor, saw him, cleared him. He came to, there was no need to take him to the hospital. He hadn't broken any vertebrae or anything like that. It did knock the wind out of him. He was unconscious for maybe a few minutes, but he came too. So now he goes off to this ski trip with the Tollisons, and he was a pretty good skier. So he would ski normally intermediate to advanced slopes. And so when he got back on Good Friday of all the days in the year, he could have come home. He came home on Good Friday. So he got home, and the first thing he told me was, uh, Mom, um, I can't run. When Mrs. Tollison uh, and Mr. Tollison pulled over, we went to, I can't remember what fast food place it was, maybe Taco Bell or whatever. And it says Derek and Kenneth went running, but I felt like I had cement in my legs, so I couldn't really run. So, actually, I recall now that the night before he had mentioned to me, that he felt like he had cement in his legs. But he, he wasn't at the point where he couldn't run yet. That didn't happen until Friday. So at the time I had told him, I said, well, you know, Kyle, you're, you're used to living at sea level and you're up at 70,000 feet of elevation. So you might have a touch of seasickness and you're not used to skiing for six, seven, eight hours a day. That's a tremendous amount of fatigue and you're in an environment less oxygen so again you might have some sort of altitude sickness or whatnot so I dismissed it I didn't really think anything of it so we got home on Friday he seemed to be okay Saturday we go to a friend's home in Fullerton California to a barbecue and when we went to get out of the car he actually tripped on the sidewalk he, he could not manage the curve to lift up his foot and Entirely to step on the curb and then walk on the sidewalk. And so he ended up tripping. And when he fell, normally when people fall, you can break the fall with your hands. But apparently, state of the art equipment with the most brilliant physicians from all over the world are at Children's Hospital in Orange County, right here in our backyard. So there's no lack of medicine, there's no lack of technology, there's no lack of resources, there's no lack of equipment. There's no lack of facilities. And I said, and you have an army of almost a thousand people that as we speak are now praying for you too. And that number will grow. So I don't know what this is, but we're going to face this together. So 20 minutes later, we're at Children's Hospital at Orange County. The nurses meet us at the emergency room. And the lady first says to me, is, is he handicapped? I said, no, he's not handicapped. He was just on Black Diamond Runs on Friday, 
skiing for the last week up in Northern California, up in Tahoe. She's like, oh my gosh, because he clearly was walking and behaving like a handicapped child. And that's why she asked that question. And I said, no. And by the way, Dr. Chang has already called in you know, to the pediatric neurologist. She said that we could have an MRI, a CAT scan, a brain scan, yada, yada, yada. She said immediately. So what ended up happening was it took five and a half weeks to diagnose him with Guillain-Barre. That first day, I actually mentioned to the nurses as um, they were, within that first hour, they were doing a brain scan on him. And I asked, I go, is there any chance that this could be Guillain-Barre? And the nurse looked at me, she said, it's a possibility, that's something that we have to rule out, but there's no diagnostic lab test, it's not like you can just take a blood test um, and see in a, in a petri dish or lab results, Guillain-Barre, it's a process of elimination. She goes, how'd you know about Guillain-Barre? And I said, well, I just happened to read about it. You know, you know, so he had all the different symptoms and so forth. Um, but statistically, it seems impossible. So she says, yeah, we'll have to, it's a process of elimination, so we have to test him for everything and rule, that, rule it out. So it, it's, a, it's quite a process. So he ended up having five and a half weeks of testing, of being poked and prodded in every way, shape, or form. What I can say, what I did as a mother from day one was I knew that I could not afford the luxury of a negative thought. I just couldn't. I needed to be strong for him. This was not about me. This was not about me feeling sorry for myself. Why is this happening to me? No, this was all about him. How am I going to stand in the gap for him? How am I going to stand there in strength for him as he goes through this challenge, through this trial in his life? We are facing the unknown at a very big level. For someone who doesn't get colds, doesn't get blues, our family, we just don't get sick. Anybody who knows us, you'll know that everybody else around us gets the flu, everybody around us gets cold, everybody around us, everybody around us gets allergy. We don't get anything. So to now be faced with this was a paramount, huge uh, challenge. And so I just knew that I needed to be solid. So I was walking, if you will, in an energetic bubble shielded by everyone. Even though I knew that everybody was praying and all friends and family and acquaintances and neighbors and all of that, but I had to be completely solid, resolute in my being from my soul going all the way out because I knew that if I even wavered a little bit in the presence of my son, even if I were outside of the room, he was going to feel it. That's not going to happen. I was going to be solid. So I can honestly say that I did not cry once during that whole 11 and a half week fiasco. Now, that is in light of having my mother-in-law show up to the hospital seeing him because he he went from 79 pounds to 57 pounds in a week he dropped so much weight that he looked like a skeleton that first week because the syndrome started to eat not just the nerves but it started to eat away at the muscle so he ended up being ghastly thin he was, I mean, they actually had to inject fat into him to keep him from losing any further weight because he couldn't afford to lose weight. He was already a thin guy to begin with. He was just thin, lean, solid muscle. Now all of a sudden he was just skin and bones. So now I've got my mother-in-law who every time she's coming over every day to see him, she's like, you know, she would go see him and then in the hallway she would be weeping uncontrollably. My sister-in-law would be just like completely all red-faced and weeping also. And 
Some of my girlfriends were, you know, and rightfully so. I understand that. But I was in this bubble. I knew that he was going to be fine. I held the vision in my mind of how he was prior to this circumstance. And I kept up the pep talk with him, with Kyle. And I told him, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. I can do all things in him through him. I believe that's Mark 10, 27. And that's a scripture in the New Testament. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strength, strengthens me is Philippians 4, 16. But Mark 10, 27, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So I can do all things through him, through God, through the divine, through the quantum, through that it, higher intelligence source, intelligence that is bigger and greater, that has the wisdom to put us together and knows all things at all time. And so I was resolute with him in that space. Out of the 11 and a half weeks that he was in the hospital, he had one really bad day where he was in a really bad rank mood. And that day, I gotta tell you, it really, it really hurt me to see him in that condition. And I knew that he was entitled to have Pardon my French, but he was having a really shitty day. But think about it. He was paralyzed from the neck down. Couldn't move his hands, couldn't move his arms, couldn't sit up, couldn't, couldn't do a bloody thing. He was basically paralyzed from the neck down. So he's entitled to have his bad days. I just had to stand solid and firm and I knew that I couldn't afford the luxury of a negative thought. Now, I gotta share my experience. Uh, my my uh, husband, who uh, was then my husband, was absolutely phenomenal. He was there at the hospital. We were there together the entire time. Luckily, my mother took my other two kids because since they were under 12, they couldn't be in the pediatric intensive care uh, unit because it's kids 12 and up. And, they were younger. He was only 11 himself, so he only had a few friends that were classmates that could go in and pick you. The majority of them weren't allowed because they were under 12. So the one thing I, I wanted to mention was that the most difficult time for me, believe it or not, wasn't when I was in the hospital with him there all the time, 24-7. The days turn into nights, the nights turn into days. And pick you don't, you don't have windows, so you don't have a distinguishing of day or night. It's it just is all the time. It's the same lighting all the time. So the days kind of meld together. So my challenge was when I would go home, I'd go go home late at night. It was usually around eleven o'clock at night, and I had this big two-story, three thousand square foot home. It's all dark, and now I'm running home to take a quick shower, put on some fresh clothes, and then run back to the hospital. It's interesting how the mind works, but it, because it wasn't until I stepped into my master bedroom, and when I was in my master bedroom, all of a sudden, I saw from the left-hand side of the motion picture screen of my mind's eye, even though my eyes were open, I saw a black um, a black box with chrome edges in a cemetery. Bright blue skies, sunny day, and the coffin was slowly floating by. That's a very jarring image to be greeted with when I'm minding my own business and I'm just trying to hurry up, go take a shower, change my clothes and run back. And so for a little bit there, I thought, maybe he's taking a turn for a worse. That was inside my head. Maybe he's taking a turn for the worse as I'm here in this room. So out loud, and I, now I realize that that was part of my journey of self-mastery. I didn't realize it then. I know that now. 
So as I heard that inside my head, I had to say out loud to myself and to the universe, I had to say, no, he is taking a turn for the better. He can do all things through him who strengthens him. He is taking a turn for the better. 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 And I had to, like an obsessed maniac, continue with that mantra the entire time as I got undressed, as I took a shower, as I dried myself on, off, as I put my new clothes on, as I got my assets into the car and drove back to the hospital until I got out of the car again. He's taking a turn for the better. 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 I needed that for me and I needed that for we. I needed it for both of us. I needed it for our family. I needed to make that declaration to the universe that he was taking a turn for the better. So I arrived to the hospital. The moment I got out of my car, I was silent. And then I continued the mantra in my head. He is taking a turn for the better. He is taking a turn for the better. And it wasn't like it, he was taking, no. I was in joy. He is taking a turn for the better. He is taking a turn for the better. I had to pivot that from when I started. The no, he is taking a turn for the better. And I had to gradually put that into a better feeling. He is taking a turn for the better. A joyful anticipation. And then as I continued to recant that in my head until I walked into his room again. And then of course I saw him watching Bart Simpson with his dad. Something that prior to that, that was forbidden. But at that point, it's like, you can watch whatever you want to watch at this point. And so that is what we had to do. And that's what I had to do as a mother. And so if you are a mom and you have a child fighting a battle, a challenge with either a neurological disorder or some sort of disease or diagnosis of some sort of bizarre, strange, never heard of um, condition, whatever the case may be, I'm going to call out to you heart to heart from one soul to the other and tell you, not only you can do this, you have to do this. You need to put yourself aside. It's not about you. It's about your kid. They need to see your unwavering faith, your unwavering belief, your unwavering knowing that things are going to turn out for the best, that things are taking a turn for the better. And you need to have that vision so crystal clear in your mind that your child is going to make a comeback and they're going to be bigger, better, and stronger than they were before. And what's interesting was that I didn't know how bad this was going to get because I just four months before my son was afflicted with this, my husband's coworker in the month of December, a guy who was like 46 or 47 or 48 years old, he came down with Guillain-Barre and he died from Guillain-Barre. He passed because when the syndrome it, what happens is your um, peripheral nervous system, your immune system turns on your peripheral nervous system and your nerves look like, like your hands. These are the dendrites. At the, you have your nerve has a tail and then you have the axon, you have the nucleus of the nerve and then the fingers which are your dendrites and then you have little like cilia that fire off, you know, fire and wire the electrical impulses to the other nerves and as they touch each other they send off electrical communication and that's what signals your muscles to open and close and move and you're able to move your body. So with Guillain-Barre, your 
peripheral nervous system is attacked by your immune system. Your immune system thinks that this is a foreign entity that's bad, so it starts to eat the dendrites in one form of Guillain-Barre. In the axonal form of Guillain-Barre, it eats not only the dendrites, it eats the whole axon, it eats the whole top, and it just leaves the stem. That's the form. My son had the worst form of Guillain-Barre. So what happens is you, it starts to manifest as a paralysis that begins with your legs, and that's why you have a paralysis of your legs. Where you, first, you have trouble walking. Eventually, you're paralyzed from your legs. As it moves up your body, it eventually gets to a point where it hits your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is what pushes your lungs up and down as your lungs contract and expand. Your diaphragm is what pushes them up and pushes them down. When the nerves of your diaphragm are affected and that is paralyzed, then people go into respiratory arrest. That's what happened to my husband's co-worker. They didn't catch it in time and so he died of respiratory failure as a result of young birth. So my prayer, when I saw that this was traveling up his body and he was paralyzed from the neck down, his brain was never affected, his breathing was never affected. But my prayer was from day one that his breathing would never be affected. If it was Guillain-Barre or anything along those lines. Because I thought to myself, I can't imagine how anguishing it would be to not be able to breathe. That, to me, it would be terrifying. And I didn't want him to experience that. I knew that this wasn't going to take him though. And that is something I need to make clear. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that this wasn't going to take him. What I didn't know was how bad it was going to get. So I asked that he would be spared that and that he would make a full recovery. He did make a full recovery. This is not about impressing you, but to impress upon you that this is doable, that you can come out the other side that your child can heal and that you can have a very large impact on how this unfolds and how your family acts and reacts to this. There's no question about it. It's probably the biggest challenge you will ever face. It's been the biggest challenge that I have faced and I had have had a history where I had four pregnancies, lost the first one, the other three, the three kids that I have are the three children from those three pregnancies. They were all three high risk pregnancies. So I've had my, I've been tested at great levels when it comes to medical challenges. I've had to overcome quite a bit. I had to defy the laws of nature with my body when the doctor said, that's it, your body is, it's, done, There's, your body can't hold on anymore. It's like you're, you're completely um, wiped out. And so I know a thing or two about dealing with these medical circumstances and being in and out of the hospital. Uh, with my daughter, I was in and out of the hospital 17 times. With all three of them, I was in the hospital four months because I started with preterm labor. With my, with Kyle, I started when he was 24 weeks. Um, with the other two, I was 18 weeks, for the love of Pete, 18 weeks, and they still ended up being, all three of them were two months early. They were all born at 32 and a half and 33 weeks, because I got a little balloon. I'm a little girl, but I happen to have a little balloon instead of a normal size uterus. It's 33% smaller than the normal size, so the eviction process starts pretty early on because they run out of room. So if you or someone you know is experiencing something having to do with preterm labor, anything having to do with um, you know, being in bed rest or a child with some sort of neurological disorder, um, I've been around the block of the whole neurological disorder thing. We had to do that with Kyle and unfortunately we had a bout with my son Nicholas and a little bit with my daughter Christelle with these unexplicable migraines and other strange symptoms. So, been there. So, if I can help you or someone you know get through to the other side and then seize the victory of health 
not only for yourself, but for your kids. That's a reason to stay in meditation every day. Just like brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth every morning and every night. You should be meditating every morning and every night. And once you start and you start gleaning, you benefit from the fruits of that task, you're never gonna wanna stop because it is such a magical state to be in. So that's it. I wanted to do this video because somebody else on Facebook has a baby with a neurological disorder and they're having a very tough time. And so I wanted to make this video for you. I've had several people with similar circumstances reaching out to me for this. Once I had three or more people reach out to me with stuff like this, I'm, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm, I'm committing to, I, I don't want to say promise, because if I promise, that means I absolutely positively have to. And sometimes it's hard to get these videos done and edited. I can get them filmed all day long, but to get them edited and up and so forth, especially while traveling, it can be a little bit challenging, but it's really important to me because I know it can make all the difference in the world to you. The one person who clicked on this video and who's watching this right now. Okay, that's it. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm Daniel Liam Walker. I hope that you have benefited the time that you've invested here watching this video. Ciao for now. From beautiful Malta. Bye-bye now.